text the other day from a friend of mine whose eighth grader scored a big touchdown in a rivalry game. So uh, sorry to make you relive this if you're a big TVS diehard, but check this video out. Did you see it? I know you heard it. A few of you see it. Most of us don't. The thing you heard at the very beginning was pretty cool. In fact, there's all kinds of cool stuff in that video for me. Uh, that's a different doxology mom providing color commentary for you. Provided, uh, I, I promised Dan DeBose I would not mention the name of his wife. So um, that was her voice that was doing the color commentary. Uh, more than one doxology kid involved in that play. One throws the lead block that uh, busts that play wide open. I wish I could point out all of it. I've watched that video dozens of times, partly because I'm excited for those parents and those kids, uh, but mostly to figure out something that happens in the first three seconds of the video. And I wonder if you saw it. In fact, watch it again, and we'll pause it when it happens. Check this out again. Okay, you heard it. Do you see it? So most of us don't. Now, the, the thing that you hear is the voice of the quarterback's dad saying, there it is. Now think about this, he knows it's a touchdown a full five seconds before anybody else in the video begins to cheer. From this moment right here on the screen that you see, the ball's still in the background, back, backfield. The guy knows that it's gonna break and maybe one or two of you can see it. You knew it was gonna happen too, not me. We are all looking at the exact same thing in the exact same place at the exact same time but that guy sees stuff that I can't see. So not just football. Some people are like this in business. You ever met a person like that? Some people are like this with the stock market. Some people are like this at board games, card games. My grandfather's twin brother was this way with dominoes. We could play around the table two times and he instantly knew what everybody had in their hand. It was crazy. And it's frustrating when it makes a person unbeatable at dominoes. But most of the time, being around somebody like that is pretty cool. Like watching somebody like that is incredibly fun. It changes your perspective. It increases your enjoyment of the moment that you're in, whatever it is that you're looking at. And in the right context, having somebody like that that can see what everybody can't see on your team is a difference maker in all kinds of important ways. So here's what we're gonna to do today. Here's what we're gonna to see today. We're gonna to leave today having seen that actually Jesus is inviting every single one of us to be that kind of person in life. The kind of person who sees what everybody can't see. And to live in a way that actually brings that perspective increases the enjoyment of all of the people around of us. That's a difference maker in all of the most important and sometimes even eternal kinds of ways. How does that show up? Well, it might surprise you. It might make you more than just a little bit uncomfortable until you consider that maybe, just maybe, Jesus sees stuff that we can't see and that seeing it is key to seeing things and showing things to other people that perhaps they may not be able to see. Look at the story, Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse one. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what's this I hear about you? Give an account for your management because you cannot be manager any longer. So not unlike today, uh, in Jesus' day, a person that had considerable wealth would hire a person to manage all of their finances or their real estate or all of their investments. And somehow this rich guy finds out that the person who was in charge of managing all of his investments was wasting or squandering his money. So he calls him in, he hands him a pink slip, 
says, let's settle up accounts because I can't trust you with my stuff anymore. You're not working here anymore. What exactly did the guy do wrong? Well, we don't know for sure, but I think we're about to get a big fat giant clue. What we do know is that in this moment, this manager has a career problem. It's even bigger than some of the Oklahoma State coaching staff if you read Twitter this morning. <laughs> if you're in the financial industry, you get accused of wasting somebody's fortune. That's a little bit of a resume killer. And this guy knows it. To so keep reading, verse three. The manager says to himself, what do I do now? My master's taken away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. So that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of the manager's debtor. He asked the first, now check out this question. How much do you owe my master? That question feels like a pretty big clue into what this guy's done wrong, doesn't it? I mean, I mean, if my money manager doesn't know how much of my money she's got invested where, we're pretty much literally in you had one job kind of territory. This guy has a lot of money and resources entrusted to him by the person who owns it and he doesn't know how much is invested where? We're gonna come back to that, but keep reading. The guy says, verse six, 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. So scholars, just in case you haven't looked at the olive oil market recently, tell us that 900 gallons of olive oil was probably the equivalent of two to three years middle-class wages. So probably 100 to 150 grand in today's money. 100 bushels of wheat is in the neighborhood of 20 times what a normal family plot would make. So we may be talking about the equivalent of a million dollars there. The manager goes to the olive oil guy and says, hey, uh, cut it in half. Goes to the bushels of wheat guy and says, if you have 80% today, we'll take it. You have to imagine those debtors going, really? God, thanks, man. Um, yeah, t tell, you, tell you what, if I can ever do anything for you, just say the word. I mean, I'm your guy, just call me which is exactly the point, isn't it? The manager's going, <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. Maybe quicker than you think. The, the whole thing is part of a plan so that someone else might hire him, presumably to manage their household. Well, let's push pause here for a second because it's easy to misunderstand what's happening here. At first glance, it feels like this manager is completely defrauding the owner of his money in order to save his own hide. That's almost certainly not what's going on here. And we know because of how the owner responds and then also because of how Jesus applies the parable. Here's what I think's going on here. Whether it was charged as interest or as commission, one of the ways that arrangements like this would work in the ancient world is the manager would know the retail price of the commodity, whatever it was. And then he was free to sell the commodity or invest the commodity with a person and then to charge on the top whatever he wanted to make. He'd sell it at whatever kind of markup he could get and then he'd take part of the cut. Remember tax collectors in Rome, they got to do the same thing. What's likely happening here is the manager's cutting out his part of the deal. He's just doing away with his commission. The owner gets his money back out of the olive oil, maybe with a little bit of growth even but the manager doesn't make any money on the deal. That's the only way that the owner's response makes any sense. Look how the owner responds, verse eight. The master commended the dishonest, literally the unfaithful manager, because he had acted shrewdly. Okay, no way that this is a, <laughs> well, you got me kind of moment out of the owner. Like you don't do that with this kind of money. You have never in your life ever met a kind of person who would do that, they don't exist. Think about this, because this is the point. 
If the manager is just thinking short term, this decision doesn't make any sense for him, does it? This seems really, really dumb to go with less commission or zero commission when you know the clock is ticking on your job and your source of income altogether. That's what the whole story hinges on. The manager's just not seeing this situation in the short term. He sees the whole situation differently in this moment. Yeah, he, he's going to have to deal with a little bit less in this moment. Yeah, he's parting with what he could have had right now, right this minute. But through his eyes, this makes total sense. And it makes total sense to us because Jesus makes sure that we see what he sees. He sees in this moment, it is better to take a short-term loss of something that is limited if it will help you enjoy something that is not limited at all. And notice what Jesus says, the second half of verse 8. It says, For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. You hear what he's saying? Like, how is it that it doesn't take eyes of faith for all of us to see this principle at work in our everyday world, but that people of the light, who by definition ought to see more, don't generally seem to apply this principle to the things that we can see. Here's what Jesus is pointing to, and it's really true, whatever you believe. The way we manage our money will always reveal the future we're seeing. The way we manage our money will always reveal the future we're seeing. And look, this is not a rich or poor thing. This is not a Jesus or church thing. This is a true about everyone thing. That's actually Jesus' point. Your financial planner, if you have a financial planner, thinks this way. You hope they do at least. It's why they move your money around into the things that they move your money around to, when they do, where they do. My grandpa thought this way about his money. He did not have a financial manager. He grew up in the Depression era and kept a significant portion of his life savings in mason jars in the tornado cellar. Because what he'd seen growing up affected the rest of his life and his outlook for what he saw coming at the end of his life. And it's why he managed his money the way he managed his money. It revealed the future he saw. It's why you fight with your kids, isn't it, about the way that they handle their birthday money? Because you too see a different future. Everybody thinks this way. That's just the everybody part of this message. The way we manage our money will reveal the future that we're seeing. But then Jesus turns to the people who follow him, and he begins speaking to us. Let me just say that. If you do not follow Jesus, you do not have to follow Jesus in this. But if you do follow Jesus, this is how he wants you to see. He wants you to show something to the rest of the world through what you see. Look at verse 9. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Do you see what Jesus is saying? You're not being fired, but you've got limited time and limited resources on this side of eternity. Jesus says, you gotta see the clock is ticking on your ability to manage the resources that you've been trusted with. That's true for all of us. So rather than simply spending all your time and effort to get more temporary stuff, to get temporary relationships here and now, why don't you take your limited time and resources and manage them towards something that is not limited at all? And notice here, the emphasis that Jesus gives is not on stuff. In the future, you notice he doesn't say, Use your worldly wealth to get a bigger mansion in heaven, to get more jewels for your crown in heaven. We had this conversation in our community group this week. What are riches in heaven? Well, here Jesus talks about friends and a welcome. 
He talks about someones and stories. Here's the point of what Jesus is inviting us to follow him into. He's inviting us to transform today's temporary stuff into forever's someones and stories. To transform today's temporary stuff into forever someone and stories. Jesus is saying, look, you've got a chance to see a future where you step into heaven and someone or someones rush up to you and say, look, you may not know me. You may not remember it. You may not have had any idea at the time, but you made an investment of something temporary, your time, your money, your expertise, your resources. You made an investment in something temporary into something or someone, and that something or someone is the reason that I'm here. Your resources are gone someday. You didn't bring them with you. And yet, in another sense, they're standing right there. Jesus is inviting you to see a future like that even if nobody else does. The someones and the stories. I've told you before, I am totally convinced that a significant part of the joy of heaven will be tracing the faithfulness of God through us to the stories of others. How a, a, a relatively insignificant decision or a sacrifice that somebody made 400 years ago or 4,000 years ago had a ripple effect, like the butterfly effect, resulted in a story of God's goodness to us. And similarly, how we invested our temporary life in specific ways that were part of God's goodness to people that we won't meet on this side of heaven. That's what Jesus is inviting us to see and to live into. So the question is, how do I do that? Well, I think you see a little of that in Jesus' story. Let me draw out a couple of things from the story here and then let Jesus cast a little vision for how we see Okay, first thing, let's just be honest. Um, some of us couldn't follow Jesus in this, even if we wanted to follow Jesus in this, because the truth is we're sort of like the manager at the very beginning of the story that Jesus calls unfaithful. We sort of get that our resources are not our resources. We're temporarily managing them for the God who owns everything. But if we're honest with ourselves, we have no idea where his resources are going. And that's not to guilt us or to shame us. Notice, Jesus' story assumes that his followers are starting there, but won't want to stay there when they see what he sees. The first step, if you see that you've lived like this guy, I'm sorry it's cheesy, but you won't forget it, is this. You've got to be knowing where the money is going. You've got to be knowing where the money is going. And let me just give you two really practical things here. And again, this comes right out of this story. The first thing is just decide to start. If you want to be knowing where the money is going, first thing is you got to decide to start. Just like with any dis discipline, it begins with the decision to start. So some of you know our, our music director, Michael Pittman. He's been on this physical health journey for the last year or so. He's down more than 100 pounds. It's unbelievable. And I asked him uh, not long ago how he did it. No lie. He said, I just started. Some of you, that's the decision financially today to decide I'm going to get on the right side of this from here, wherever here is. I'm going to be knowing where the money entrusted to me is going. Decide to start. Got to start somewhere. And then from there, you're able to get strategic. Here in the passage, Jesus calls it shrewd. Shrewd has a negative connotation in our day. It's not a negative word. It just means to have a plan. This is what we tell our kids. This is what we tell every single couple that comes through premarital counseling in any of the offices here at the church or in two to one here at the church. You've got to decide ahead of time what percentage of your income you're going to live on. You have to decide that. If you don't decide that, someone else or something else is going to decide that for you, and you're going to end up upside down, like most of the people in the world. That's not God's best. And it's ultimately not what you want. 
Get strategic. If you don't know how to do that, we want to help you do that. We offer a class called Financial Peace. It's the best material we've found to help you do that, to help you develop and work a strategy to get free of the anxiety that money can cause and to set you up to manage your resources rather than your resources managing you. In fact, we're doing a one-time preview class this fall. We'll let you test it out. Decide if you want to follow through on it after the holidays. But that, that's thing one. You've got to be knowing where your money is going. And the first step is to start. And it gets strategic from there. So Jesus is inviting us into in the story when we see life the way he sees it. But the second thing that Jesus' story is designed to show us is that we can be people who aim at eternal momentum, not just mow money today. To be people that aim at eternal momentum, not just mow money today. Now, I remember when I first started learning about investments, learning about compounding interest and the law of doubling sevens and tens. Are you familiar with that? This is the coolest thing in the world. If you, if you invest a sum of money at 7% interest, it will double in 10 years. If you invest it at 10% interest, it will double in seven years. So obviously the, the goal is to invest as much as you can, as early as you can, for as long as you can, because investments tend to be like a snowball moving downhill. They gain momentum and pick up speed. Remember Jesus' point. Jesus says, look, even people that don't believe in eternity, even people that don't believe in the protective heavenly father who provides for them, believe that. What if you could put your money to work towards something that would have momentum that you could still enjoy 30 billion years from now? Wouldn't you at least be as strategic as them if you saw a future like that? putting at least some portion away for 30 billion years from now? I'll tell you, the people that really get that, people that really see that, they live differently. Temporarily just investing towards retirement early, but with the same principle when it comes to eternity. How can I build as much momentum as possible that goes for as long as possible? And if you want to live that way, just like with everything else, you've got to start somewhere. And start where you are, not where you wish you were. Now, some of you, when you start knowing where your money is going, you're going to discover you have 0% of your money invested towards anything that will last beyond you. If that's you, what if you just decided to go from nothing to something invested in eternity? You've got nothing invested in eternity, you could invest something in eternity. I already gave you, come on, all of the caveats last week. Okay, if you don't trust us here, don't give it here. Don't invest it here. But this is a really simple, obvious place for a whole lot of people to start. I mean, you trust us with your kids. You trust us with your spiritual formation. You trust us for the work that we're doing in a city. Put it another way, you're a someone here with a story. Somebody who made an investment here believes we'll have a return with them forever. So I'm not after your money. Doxology is not in financial trouble. In fact, we just finished an independent financial audit a few weeks ago. I got the email last night. We breeze through with flying colors because we take this thing eternally seriously here. But maybe take a step from nothing to something if that's a step for you to take. This is one place that you could consider making that kind of investment. Some of us, hear me now, believe me later, would benefit from making a move from something to something strategic. You've moved from nothing to something. You could benefit from a step from something to something strategic. Okay, Jesus' point, wise people do this with almost literally every other investment. Why wouldn't we do it with eternal ones? Pick a percentage and have a plan. Hey, you hear people talk about a tithe sometimes. That's an Old Testament word you're not obligated to in Christ. Okay, that was a number that for them was somewhere between 10 and 30% depending on the year. It was also their eternal investment and also their federal taxes combined in the Old Testament. So you and I are not obligated to 10%. We are not limited to 30%. Don't hear any of that in the invitation. The invitation is set a goal, get strategic, and set a time that you'll reevaluate. 
Pick a percentage that might stretch you just a tiny bit and put a reminder on your calendar for when you're going to come back to it. Maybe once a quarter, twice a year. New Year's resolution, totally up to you. But go from something to something strategic. Again, the world does this in literally every investment. Why wouldn't we see our eternal investments that way too? And then from there, I'm speaking from experience, this is where it gets really fun. Some of us, the invitation is to move from something strategic to something sacrificial. And I'm just telling you, most of the people that do this, they don't do it for recognition, so it's hard to find them or recognize them. But if you ever find somebody who will talk about it, you'll discover somebody that is not looking back from that decision at all. They hardly even consider it a sacrifice. It'll be clear back to the very beginning of the message. They see something that most of the people in the world struggle to see, but desperately wish that they could see. And showing what they see is kind of the point. Listen to what C.S. Lewis said about sacrificial giving under grace. He says this, I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. Now, he says it in 20th century British English. Do you see what he says there at the end? That's an invitation. What if you were a sign and wonder to your social class? Whether you're blue collar or white collar or no collar. A teenager, college student, or retired, where people whose household income was the same as yours, they stood in wonder because of your financial decisions. They were so hard for them to fathom because it seemed so clear to them that you see something they can't see. Where your whole life, including your standard of living and your standard of giving, invites a question for which the only answer is Jesus. That's what Jesus is inviting us into. Look, Jesus is not asking for donors. He's looking for disciples. He's inviting people to be the kind of person who sees something higher and greater and longer than anyone else in the world around you. Somebody who lives in a way that shows it to anyone who's paying attention. Our money will always point towards our hope, whether we have lots of it or not. Again, this is not an invitation from Jesus or your pastor trying to get something from you. It's an invitation from Jesus and your pastor to see something that's been given to you, promised to you, and the invitation to aim everything you have towards it, wherever you go. So that's how we want to respond. I want to pray for us, and then we're going to respond. We're not taking another offering we're going straight back to thank you. And then let gratitude move you toward whatever God has for you. Don't let it come from anywhere else. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray for the person that's come to this moment today unable to see what others around them see. They're burdened uh, by guilt and shame of some decision that they've made or the person that they've been and they wonder how they could ever be loved Lord, I pray that they would see today a God who loves them so much that he gave. He gave his only son to come into the world as a sacrifice, to die on a cross, to rise from the dead, and to give them the greatest gift imaginable, a welcome into the family of God. And I pray that, Lord, before anyone in this room would give anything, they would receive that. And then, Lord, every other thing that we have would be lived in light of that thing that we've received, that our whole life would overflow in gratitude and that our gratitude would show the world where we live that we see something that's different from what the rest of the world sees. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. In your name, amen. Church, would you stand with us as we respond and worship this morning? I was 
was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide But from the far side of the chasm You had me in your side so you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time I Aren't you thankful for that this morning? And you took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. Hey, thanks for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, we would love to connect with you. Visit doxology.church connect or leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed today's message and you want to see more, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new videos.